Uh, so, hello everybody. Uh, that was a nice introduction, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I combine uh, fashion and technology. I do this for 12 years and uh, I'm going to show you some of the things that I'm, uh, that I'm doing with this combination. Um, I started myself as a fashion designer and uh, for me, the, the designs that I was creating, um, I was doing a lot with, for example, uh, like fabrics and fashion design. But uh, for me, these designs were, um, they were analog, they were not doing anything. And I wanted my fabrics and my designs to talk. I wanted them to uh, have a heartbeat and a brain, sort of. So this is when I was 18 years old, I got into, uh, into robotics. Um, the first things that I did was strapping big computers to the body, which was not necessarily that sexy. And uh, later on, I got involved with uh, like microcontrollers. So one thing is Arduino. So pretty early on, I uh, got in contact with uh, David Kuartilas from Arduino. And he had a lab in Sweden. So I went there to see what I could do uh, with, uh, with this new uh, yeah, specialty board, sort of. And uh, this, is, uh, yeah, this is how I coupled that back to my design. So I started to create designs that were, uh, like, that were sort of yeah, creating an interaction with, with either the body itself or the surroundings. Um, I partner up a lot with the industry. So I work, uh, I work together with Intel, with Microsoft, with Audi, uh, Volkswagen, Cirque du Soleil, Disney, uh, Philips, a lot of um, yeah, brands sort of that, um, that uh, gave me the possibility uh, to do projects with them. So um, what is really valuable for me as a designer and an engineer is that they gave me the opportunity to blend my identity as a designer uh, with their DNA as a brand. So one of these collaborations, for example, was in 2015. Uh, this is the car brand Audi, and uh, they asked me to do a project uh, with them. Uh, so I said, that's cool, uh, give me a car. And uh, I didn't use this car to drive in. Um, I took out the parking sensors and the, and the LED matrix uh, headlights, sort of. And I created a series of dresses based on their manufacturing technique. So I used 3D printing, uh, this is SLS, and I created dresses that were, for example, uh, pushing out uh, 60 watts uh, high power LEDs, as you can see here, based on their uh, LED matrix uh, headlamps which was uh, super, super bright. And um, I, uh, I hope that most of the people in the audience there during the shows uh, like them. Um, uh, most of these dresses, it's a collection of 11 pieces now in China. Uh, they are walking 120 shows at this moment. Uh, so this is an, uh, yeah, a really uh, good lesson for me to make really reliable things, uh, things that are really badass and really, for example, high power, but also reliable for like more than 120 shows. Of uh, the Teensy. The Teensy is a microcontroller board created by Paul Stoffenregen in Portland, which is, an, uh, which is a buddy of me, and he's really, really awesome. Um, some of the other dresses are involving the Intel Edison as well, and uh, these are some of the, the, the concepting for that. For example, here you can see a dress that I'm working on at the moment. It has 11 little servo motors and it's breaking out of shape, sort of. And uh, the other dress is a um, projection map dress. So basically during the, during the showcase at the Audi City Berlin, this was, the, um, the model was being traced and being projected on sort of. So that was pretty cool. So this is a collection of, uh, it started as four pieces. It's now um, 11 pieces in total. And um, other than sort of at car shows, like these models crawling around over Ferraris, trying to be sexy, sort of, these girls are badass, sort of, you know? So this is also uh, together with Audi, trying to see how we can uh, gently, gently uh, change a little bit the, the notion of how females are being uh, like represented in the car industry, sort of. And for me, this is a lot about blurring the lines. One of my other dresses is an, uh, it's a cocktail dress. And it's a real one because it's really making, making cocktails. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I created it for Cirque du Soleil and I used a uh, peristaltic pump from the company Party Robotics in uh, San Francisco. And this uh, peristaltic pump is uh, based on the, on the backside. And she has a uh, mixture of gin and tonic in her hips, sort of. So by the push of a button, uh, the, the liquid comes from the hips being uh, transferred through the peristaltic pump in the backside and comes to the front and she's serving it to you. Uh, so that's, that's um, a, fun, a fun one for me. I created it for Cirque du Soleil, which we know as a theater. What uh, not much people know is that they also have a nightclub in Las Vegas and also a restaurant in Ibiza called Heart Ibiza. So this is uh, where I created these dresses for. They're in pink, they're in gold, they're in black and in white, and they're really, uh, they're really cute. 
Uh, it's based on my own uh, version of the Teensy, created uh, in collaboration with Paul. So this is the pink Teensy, so it's pink of color, and it's awesome. And these are in these, uh, in these dresses, which I'm really happy with. So here you can see some of the, the interactions. So the model is pushing a button, the peristaltic pump is on the back, it's being pushed to the front, and she's surfing it, basically. So this was in a presentation in uh, Taipei. Sometimes people just want to see how the system is working, and I stand next to it, so I, I'm the one ending up taking the shots of the people that don't want them, sort of. So that's also a really funny thing. <laughs> but so basically, uh, going back to my, uh, my research, is um, I see fashion as an, a medium. I see it as an interface. I see it for a meaning to uh, express yourself and to interact with others, sort of, so to communicate. And if you're looking at fashion, and if you're looking at the body, and if you combine it with architecture, sort of, we all have spaces around the body. So basically, we have our intimate space, we have our personal space, uh, our social space, and uh, the public space around us. And depending on different cultures and depending on your personality, for example, these, uh, these uh, spaces are fluctuating, sort of. So this is where I, for example, use proximity sensors and like little cameras within the design to actually measure the surrounding around the design. The other thing that I really like, except for robots and sensors, are animals. So for example, here you see the, the um, uh, octopus. So I do lots of cutting to biomimicry, not only seeing how plants or how things are growing and moving, sort of. Um, I also look at animals and um, uh, something called instinct and uh, behavioral aspects, and I put that towards my system. So I do not want my robots to stand next to me being modeled as humans, I want them to live on me and being modeled after animals because I think animals are cool and you can, uh, uh, you can relate a lot of the behavioral uh, aspects of animals back to your system. So for example, this is, the, this is the smoke dress, it has sensors and the more people there are around in the surroundings, the more smoke it's being uh, pushed out. So she's putting up a smoke screen as if she wants to dive away. So really this notion of an octopus sort of and reaching out far into the environment, far into the space. This dress I created uh, with an architect, his name is Nicolo Casas, and together um, we were uh, looking, uh, using Maya, so we're using Autodesk Maya here, in order to uh, create a woven structure, which is a partially flexible, but also a way that uh, we could put the, the, the smoke to the hip area, make it turn around, and then being pushed out in a very gentle, uh, in a very gentle sense. So what we ended up uh, using is a process called selective lace sintering. So basically in 3D printing you have three ways that you can print sort of, uh, sort of the more famous ways. One is uh, your PLAs, your plastics. The second one is your resins. And the third one is your powder. So what I'm doing is I use powder printing. So this is the selective laser sintering process. And uh, what I did for this dress is I used TPU, which is a thermoplastic polyurethane. So it's, an, uh, it's a rubbery material. So it's a, a semi-flexible material, which, um, yeah, which was a, a good uh, choice for this, uh, for this design. So for me, this is an, a more friendly design. This is a little bit more organic design. This is a very playful design, but it's also for me the notion of emotion and sort of uh, being able to sort of hide away in this non-materiality like smoke. And that is a little bit what uh, I like to see, fashion and technology, and then the technology also considering the poetics of that, what that can bring in a symbiotic state, or uh, a little bit merging, like the way we can interact with fashion, the way we can uh, like, yeah, have systems on our body that are maybe non-verbal and that can do some of this uh, communication. So the other part is, uh, so one part is I, I connect, I try to reach out to the, to the, um, to the surroundings. Um, at this moment of time, I have 37 dresses and all these designs and a few devices as well. And I'm not necessarily selling them. I'm more of a researcher. So what I'm interested in is, um, I'm interested in how different kinds of technology are living on the body and interacting with our body and the surroundings in different ways. So all, all these 37 dresses are doing something different. Um, and uh, yeah, for me, it's really the investigation around these, uh, these systems hosted on the body and what they can do sort of for us. So the other thing that I do is I look into uh, biosignals. So um, I look into uh, different 
ways of measuring the body. So uh, these are some of the ones that I'm not using all, uh, all, of, uh, all at the same time. I'm using them to investigate. Every project I'm trying to investigate one other or one section. So basically, if you look at biosignals and uh, capturing this, uh, you have a lot of uh, like sensory sets, for example, and they all have different places on the body. You have uh, the ED, you have the brain, you have the pulse, for example, uh, the muscle contraction, the skin conductancy, uh, the respiration. So your lung volume is really interesting regarding to measuring emotional data, actually. Um, much, maybe much more intuitive than using your heart rate. Um, accelerometer, so the place in space, uh, your heart rate. So uh, basically the heart rate and also the volume and also coupled to, uh, for example, temperature. And that I sometimes couple back to these other senses that I'm using, like proximity and all. So this is a more internal um, design that I created uh, when I was working at Intel. Um, I was working at uh, Portland at the New Devices Group in America for Intel and using the Intel Edison, I created a few designs uh, in order to learn, also giving them a feedback report on uh, how I would use um, their module. So one of the dresses I made was a Synapse here. So I used an, um, an hacked Neurosky which um, I thought I was going to investigate uh, EEG with, which I find it's more about EMD, it's more about muscle contraction, it's more about the way you use your muscles in, in, the, in the front of your face, sort of. Um, but that doesn't matter, like whatever it was capturing from, those, uh, from, from the one point measurements, um, I had a little camera in the front, and basically while my model was walking around, um, what I could see here was, um, I could see whoever was in her space, I could see what she was seeing, sort of, and I could see how her body was relating to that. So the stress level of her body. So uh, from that investigation was a little bit more uh, for me as, as, a, a research, um, uh, as a research fact, sort of. Um, at the beginning of last year, I got the pleasure to do a residency at Future Lab, so Ars Electronica. And I took, again, this notion of this dress, which can be only worn by my model in a way, you know, it's a pretty big dress with electronics in there and I want to make a more wearable version. Uh, the other thing that I was interested in was working with uh, kids and especially children with ADHD. So what I uh, did, I took that concept of having a uh, camera on the body and I correlated that to uh, like medical ED where I was a little bit uh, not satisfied with, with uh, the Neurosky development that I did. Uh, so I want to see what I could do with medical ED and ADHD. And what I wanted to create was a device, which is not, this is the 1020 system for children if you want to do uh, measure brain signals. And uh, for me, this is not a pleasant uh, kind of feel when I look at these children. Uh, there's also something called genuine data, because if these children are being measured in a white room with a doctor, uh, these children are not themselves. They're not playful. It takes like 20 minutes in, in order to get them in a mood, still their patients. So what I wanted to see is I could, if I could uh, develop a system with less electrodes, still uh, measuring uh, ADHD or measuring actually attention deficit, sort of. So what I did was I created a horn with the camera in there and it's a unicorn and everybody loves unicorns. So this was already like sort of um, uh, applicating to the playful notion for these children, sort of. So the other thing that I found out while doing this was if you're researching uh, ADHD and attention deficit, so this is basically the 1020 system. You can see the nose and the ear, so the face is pointing upwards. And um, if you're measuring ADHD, sort of, you can measure this with something called the P3 wave, so P300. And that happened to be a sort of mohawk on the middle of the head, sort of. So I could get rid of most of the other electrodes, sort of, and I wanted to see if I could only measure this, um, the attention, better than I could with the Neurosky, sort of, um, uh, by this use. So I got back to, um, yeah, to the camera and to the headset, and I started to uh, embed that in there. This is uh, without the electrodes. This is the, a little movie on just to see how um, how it would work, sort of, and what I could actually see with this camera.
So that's, that is a little bit around like working uh, towards this idea, which is a little bit more an, uh, like a playful notion. So from that, um, from that point, I created uh, like a little movie and, and sort of the concept for this. Um, I was at Ars Electronica, which is in Linz. And in Linz, there's also a company called GTEC. And GTEC is a uh, company that is doing uh, like, yeah, that is building devices, like their G-Nautilus device for uh, medical ED. And what they had there were uh, gold-plated electrodes, which they showed me, like, well, this could be cool. And for me, this is really cool because, for example, uh, if you're using, uh, like, 1020 system, you need, to have, uh, you need to have the electrode gel, which is making the hair of the children really uh, sort of slimy, which is not cool. So what, uh, what is happening here is these little uh, gold-plated um, legs, they're sticking through the hair and mounting on the skin, sort of. So you can uh, actually have direct contact with the skin without using any of the electro gel. So from there, um, yeah, back to which actually it became an, an, a collaboration with GTEC in which we were uh, like looking at uh, like at the signal. So what we could actually get. Uh, the system is based with the input, so the camera this is actually with the real sense camera, which I was uh, trying as well, the Edison. Basically, what it does is. Um, Whenever the, the child is um, uh, like uh, gets a spike in attention, the camera goes on for five seconds and it's counting also three seconds back. It's um, it's sending an eight second little movie to uh, to my computer. So basically, what we do at the end of the of the session, we go through with these children what they saw and make them understand uh, like why they are being triggered and that anything and everything around them has an effect on them and especially with ADHD. And for me, this is a little bit uh, the notion of um, uh, instead of giving a children medication, which is often happening with ADHD, they, the, the, the parents go to the doctor and it's like, okay, my, my child is being busy or my child is being a child, you know, which is normal and they get a lot of medication and uh, instead of that for uh, for example for me this is really important that uh, this is doing something else this makes the children understand how their brain is working and um, uh, except for also what I said uh, getting uh, the children easily more easily in the mood sort of by making it a playful act making it a unicorn and also making it something that they can put on their self and can put off themselves sort of so uh, this is something that at the moment I'm working on. Uh, at the end of the year, during Ars Electronica, uh, we're open sourcing this project. Um, we're actually building a set with GTEC with eight electrodes, which is called Unicorn. And we're gonna do uh, hackathons with them as well. So this later on. For me, it's a little bit about uh, thinking out of the box, sort of. Uh, so how can you make things more excite exciting or more poetic regarding to the use of technology? I'm running out of time, so I will present my last uh, project, and then I'm going to leave you wandering off in the maker, uh, the make Munich here. So uh, my last project is uh, you already saw it in the beginning. It's one of my uh, my dearest designs, sort of, uh, because it's very behavioral and it's very moody. Uh, it plays with these spaces again. These spaces I correlate back. Uh, those spaces are not uh, not uh, not created by me. This is the proxemic theory of Edward T. Hall. And basically, what Edward C. Hall did in the 60s, he was uh, he was um, he was traveling around a lot, and he saw that different people had different different space, uh, spaces depending on culture and personality. This is also something that I relate back to uh, the way that he was measuring these spaces. What was with a stick? So he was measuring this in an analog manner. So what I'm doing with my designs, I put sensors in there, and I can do it digitally and electronic. So. Um, Correlating it back to another favorite animal of mine is a spider. And again, based on the Intel Edison, uh, this is a robotic spider dress. And why it's dear to me is because it's, it's really, uh, uh, really uh, playing with a notion of, of personal space. Because when you come close to this dress, it's really literally attacking you, which you can see on the, on the next movie. <laughs> So this is, was uh, one of the other designs that I was building at uh, Portland. Uh, I was building more freaky dresses, so I think Intel was semi-happy and semi-weirded like weirded out by the fact that I was making spiders at their office, sort of. 
Uh, but then when it came out and when they saw the vision, they, they got it sort of. Uh, what Intel wanted, uh, one of the things with the Intel Edison was they want to get a little bit more closer to, for example, the maker scene and like how, how we are doing things, you know, how we are building things and how that, how that looks like sort of. So they gave me all the freedom in um, what, what I wanted to do sort of. What is important for me about this dress is um, it's not just attacking sort of. So because it knows, it knows who is in the personal space sort of. Um, it knows when you're coming closer, sort of. But it also has something else. It's very moody, and it has something called 12 states of behavior. So basically, from a more friendly mode, sort of, uh, when you uh, walk on slowly, it's more sort of dancing. If you uh, come close into the, into the personal space, it goes into something that I call Jugendstil. So it's almost a fencing mode. And then when you come too close, uh, yeah, the system is really grabbing forward, sort of. If you come into the intimate space, the little legs are pushing you away. Um, so this is something that I call 12 states of behavior and something that I want to let you wonder about regarding to creating systems and system behavior that is not only one state or not only a friendly state, maybe it's a moody state, like these systems that we are building, maybe they have their, not always their good days sort of, you know, and this is something that I like to entice and this is li why I like regarding to behavior aspects to relate a lot to animals. Uh, in the design as well, um, so here you can see like um, some of the some of the inspiration comes from uh, like for example the um, the eyes of the spider where also the um, uh, the sensors are in. So I'm using Max Botics uh, ultrasonic rangefinders uh, in order to measure up to eight meters sort of in a beam. Um, I'm using also respiration sensors, so you can see here in the kidneys, in the side of the design, I'm measuring the lung volume, because when my model had people in her near, the system was always reacting, but she has herself also control over it, so she's breathing in, and she's breathing out, and the system goes into a lynching mode, and it falls asleep, sort of. So also seeing how, the sis how you as the person itself uh, also have a an, an, uh, compromise with your system, sort of. And um, yeah, so uh, the system is based with self servo controllers from Polulu, um, and uh, like basically all the all the little servo motors are in in uh, all the um, all the hinges of the dress in the shoulders. What you can see here are the proximity sensors are in the frontal uh, balls of the design. And for me, what is really important is that I see sort of fashion becoming an interface. And then this interface is becoming a tool. It uh, starts to maybe, for example, also machine learning, it starts to listen to you. It starts to become a part of like the way you act or you, you socialize, for example. And I think that is something that really fascinates me about fashion on the body. Something that technology is in your hands, a mobile phone is in your hands, it's not listening to you. But as uh, soon as we, what we do now, uh, we put the science and robotics on the body, it can actually listen to you. So it can consider you. And I think that is one important part here. So you can see the system in the back, um, the legs on the front, the respiration sensors, the proximity sensor in the front. And we made some spiders for the Make Affair because spiders are cool. And the funny thing with these uh, spiders, so they're also the dresses SLS printed. Um, at uh, Rapid Mate in Portland, where I was working at that time. Um, the spiders are also printed in SLS in nylon, and we're using them for the, for the maker fairs, because the dress is a little bit hard to show off at maker fairs, for example, but the, the spiders we have in a dancing mode, sort of, for the, for the children. Um, the funny thing is with the spiders, like kids just take them and run away. So most of uh, us and the team that is standing at the Intel booth sort of is just there to hoard the children not stealing the spiders. So that is like one task uh, if you want to be involved with the Intel booth there, uh, which I think is really funny. So, um, so coming back to make and, uh, and all of that stuff, you know, uh, for me as a designer, I can do cool shit, you know, I can do really high couture stuff, you know, but um, if I don't share it, if I don't share it with the world, I'm, I'm maybe not doing that much of leaving a footprint here. So uh, I come from a little bit of hacker scene, so uh, from early 2000s, sort of, I'm a lot involved with maker spaces, hacker spaces, uh, fab labs and tech shops sort of all over the world. Um, I go often to cities, I give free lectures or I, I hope, uh, like, I, I like to share my knowledge or do workshops, li workshops like I do here, for example. For me, the educational aspect is really important. I'm a lot in America, especially in America. Education can be really expensive. So the maker culture coming in there and doing its thing sort of was really making sense, sort of. And uh, it's just a really cool thing. 
making but also sharing with your community so for the people that are new here enjoy what you what you see but also try to see how you can make things how you can learn sort of and how you can give it back for example regarding to uh, these are some of the things that we have github if you make uh, if you make codes if you uh, make source codes or what, uh, whatever it is um, you can upload it to github uh, 3d models thingy first instructables do it yourself sites if you want to learn some of the dresses uh, that i make are on there so you can see you do it yourself on how to make your own cocktail dress uh, but also how to make tomato soup, for example. So it's a really cool site, so check it out. Hexer.io is more regarding to hardware uh, products. And uh, then the thing that I like regarding to ED is OpenBCI, which is about brain-computer interfaces. So that's about education. So what I want to uh, close down with is... Um, what I've been talking about, sort of. For me, it's a story about analog versus digital. Uh, I see fashion as an interface, and then this interface becoming a tool. And for me, this is a playful interface. It's an emotional interface, and also a social interface. And thank you. So the last thing, the <laughs> no, last thing that, that I actually want to close down with is we're going to do an, um, a workshop with kitty ears. It's um, actually for the little ones. So it's for children between um, 8 and 14 years old. We're going to do it in area, area 21. And it's these kitty ears that I have on. And uh, they will have lads in there. So if you guys, wanna, if you guys have little ones, uh, throw them to us, sort of. And we, uh, we will entertain them for the next one half hour. Fantastic. Thank you, Anouk. Thank you very much. But the others can just watch, maybe, just to, to watch you doing this workshop, yeah. if you're more interested. So I think it's quite close to the next talk, but anyway, we have still time for some questions. Oh, sorry. If there are questions to sorry. Anouk. <laughs> They're just impressed. <laughs> yeah, are there any questions? I will take three questions. I'm also kind of saying, in the meanwhile, I'm, I really like Club Mate, and I'm really happy to have it back. And thank you, Niels, for giving me two bottles. <laughs> yeah, um, my question is, um, seeing those intricate designs on the dress, how do you come up with them? Do you use a computer program to generate them, or uh, the designs of the dresses? Do you make them by hand, or is there a computer program behind them to make them this integrate, or...? Yeah, so, um, regarding to, uh, like, most of the things that I'm doing are based in uh, the coding is Arduino or Python. Um, the design of the dresses, it's uh, depending. So the smoke dress was uh, Autodesk Maya. That was the first time that I worked with a uh, software program. What I use now is, um, like, at the moment, Fusion 360, which is an, uh, a free, uh, yeah, a free form and solid modeling tool from Autodesk. Uh, so that's something cool that you guys can check out, uh, Fusion 360. Um, and, um, that is the one that I'm working at the moment with. There's other things that you can think of sort of uh, regarding to if I educate children or like um, middle uh, size. There's a program called Blender, which is uh, open source and free, sort of, uh, created by a Dutch guy. Um, then um, some, a part of the spider dress is built with, um, uh, in the beginning, it built with uh, Rhino and Grasshopper. And then imported in Maya again, uh, because that was like a more of my tool, sort of. Um, so yeah, there is uh, different ways of constructing this. Actually, myself, I come from an um, I come from an um, uh, what I started with was sculpting. So I was sculpting my designs in the past, uh, so early 2000s from airplane epoxy. Um, and at one point, I got really sick. My lungs, I got really sick from the dust. And this is why I actually got into 3D printing. Not because it's cool, but I really needed it because I got really uh, super ill. So in uh, like 2008, 2009, I got into 3D modeling using uh, Autodesk uh, Maya. Yeah, thank you. Um, the spider dress, yes. What what does it cost? Uh, I think it's really expensive to <laughs> yeah. make this. Um, so basically what you see here is um, it's a leather dress underneath, sort of. So yeah, leather would cost like 300 uh, and then sort of you make it. But uh, yeah, the technique that I'm using is selective lace sintering. So basically um, if you print the caress, like the, the frontal piece, it takes about like one and a half day to print. And uh, the cost of like the whole part with the shoulder pieces um, is, I think, like 
four to six thousand. I, it was in between, I can, because it was like two years ago. So SLS is still a pretty expensive way to print. That's why I mostly use these things also as research, what I say, because I'm not necessarily really out to uh, like to sell it. But then it's also uh, the programming, the electronics and all that yeah. stuff, you know. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it's an expensive hobby. Mm -hmm. But nice. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay. So thank you again, Anouk. Very inspiring. And to enjoy the Make Munich. <laughs>